So greetings. This is Rafael Ruiz from Kinokuniya Bookstores in New York City, and we are speaking today with author Mike J. Mike J. has written extensively on scientific and medical history. His books on the history of drugs include High Society, Mind Altering Drugs in History and Culture, and The Atmosphere of Heaven. He writes regularly for the London Review of Books, including reads on madness and revolution, memory, and hallucinations. He also writes for the Wall Street Journal and the Literary, Literary Review, including a piece on Philip K. Dick. He writes a collection of essays called Stranger Than Fiction on Forgotten Aspects of History, a fascinating treatise on madness and the asylum in The Way Madness Lies, and there is much more we haven't mentioned, but I must admit that is quite an impressive bio. <laughs> so how are you today, Mike? Very good, thanks. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you for agreeing to meet with us. Oh, pleasure. So your book, Mescaline, A Global History of the First Psychedelic, published by Yale University Press, is out mm -hmm. in paperback. And um, I have some general questions about the book that I'm hoping to get some insight on. First sure. one um, is experimentation in psychedelics has had a colorful and controversial history. Uh, what brought you to write your latest book on this topic and why is this important now? Well, I've, uh, uh, psychedelics clearly are having a moment. Uh, and it's a subject that I've written on a bit in the past, um, but I thought this would be a good time to um, write a book. And mescaline as a subject was what really, uh, really appealed to me um, because it's the, you know, that's where the whole story started with Aldous Huxley's uh, mescaline experiment in uh, the doors of perception. Um, but also, you know, this moment that we're having with psychedelics comes with the sense that that was where the story of psychedelics began. Mm -hmm. And then in the 60s, it was suppressed. And now we're finally getting to grips with it again. If you look at the history of mescaline, you get a very different story. Uh, mm -hmm. You can see that scientific engagement with this goes way back, you know, back to the 19th century. And, you know, before that, uh, the mescaline containing cacti, the peyote mm -hmm. in the San Pedro, used for millennia by indigenous cultures up and down the Americas. Mm -hmm. So I thought this would be a really good time to present uh, a more kind of panoramic, wide ranging history of psychedelics across um, different times uh -huh. and places. That's actually fascinating. So how would you say mescaline compares with other psychedelics? Is there a, like a qualified difference in experience between the drugs or is it something a completely different category? How would you actually compare? Well, chemically, mescaline mm -hmm. is a little different from the other psychedelics, things like LSD, uh -huh. Um, DMT or uh, psilocybin and magic mm -hmm. mushrooms. Um, these are all compounds that are known as tryptamines, you know, active okay. at very small doses mm -hmm. in the brain. Mescaline is a slightly different type of compound. It's a phenethylamine uh, mm -hmm. and it acts in a slightly different way. It's more, it's not so easily assimilated. So you have to take mm -hmm. larger doses of it. So a, a gram of mescaline is like three doses, but a, a gram okay. of LSD is, you know, thousands of doses. Uh, so when you take mescaline, it takes a little longer to get through the blood brain barrier. It kind yeah. of hits you a little bit more physically. Um, it's a much more embodied experience. And that might be pleasant in terms of, uh, you know, energizing and euphoric, or it might mm -hmm. be a little harder to handle in terms of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, nausea and, um, you know, becoming kind of comatose. And it lasts a little bit longer, like kind of 12 hours. So, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, it's, uh, it's certainly within the broad spectrum of psychedelics, but it's got its own space. I think probably the closest thing that's familiar in the sort of uh, um, today's drug culture is uh, MDMA or ecstasy, which mm. was uh, originally kind of developed as a derivative from mescaline. Oh, wow. That I did not know at all. Um, so this might require a little bit of oversimplification, but what would you like readers to gain um, from reading your book? Well, I think... First of all, I hope readers would enjoy it. So, you know, it's full of kind of colorful stories and I think stuff that a lot of people don't know, a lot of stuff that hasn't been written about before. 
a lot of stuff that's kind of only available in um, you know Spanish or German or French. So uh, oh. I think it kind of brings it has a bigger frame of reference than most stuff. But also I would like people just to remember as we go into our sort of uh, current obsession with psychedelics that uh, oh. there are other ways of experiencing them at other times and in other places and in other cultures. Psychedelics have meant other things that are really quite different. Mm -hmm. So you just mentioned right now, like, the, like this current obsession with um, psychedelics mm -hmm. right now. How are you? Do you see that as a fully negative thing that's happening? Or do you think there's kind of potential in that as the research is coming out? I think there's great potential in it. I think um, there are dangers in this medical mm -hmm. and clinical focus. I think okay. um, psychedelics don't really fit into that way of doing things very well. Um, but, you know, if it, it's, you know, I mean, there are indigenous traditions of healing with psychedelics go back mm -hmm. thousands of years. And I think, you know, a lot of people who use psychedelics you know in the sort of uh, um, illicit market you know what you might call recreational you know uh -huh. that seems to me to beg a lot of questions I think a lot of recreational is probably actually therapeutic either in terms of actual you know sort of intentional healing or sort of broader ideas of well-being. So to go off something you just mentioned um, I'm talking about like indigenous cultures so indigenous mm -hmm. cultures especially Native American cultures were key to the exploration of psychedelic experience um, can you tell us how the, their exploration um, was and how they actually used these substances in their own practices? Yeah, uh, there's, um, there are two. Um, mescaline is only curiously uh, only found in nature in cacti and in two particular cacti, which are very, very different from each other. Uh, one is the San Pedro cactus, as it's called, or the Huachuma, as it's known in the mm -hmm. Andes. Okay. And that's still used in... Uh, kind of um, healing and divination ceremonies today. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one is the peyote cactus, probably peyote. more familiar, mm -hmm. which grows in um, uh, Mexico and a little bit across the border in Texas. And um, that was the conduit from, uh, 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 you know, between indigenous culture and sort of modern uh, Western um, scientific exploration. And that's a fascinating story that I focus on in the book um, through two parallel um, stories. One of a ethnographer from the Smithsonian Institution called James Mooney, who was the first white man to participate in a peyote ceremony, oh. and also from Quana Parker, who was the chief of the Comanches uh, and you know, one of the early proselytizers and advocates. And these two figures came together in Oklahoma in the 1890s, and uh, Quana Parker sold James Mooney a big bag of dried peyote buttons, <laughs> which he took back to Washington. And that, that, that was that kicked off, you know, the first scientific exploration of psychedelics and uh, those were the peyote buttons that, you know, people like William James ended up taking. So it's a fascinating oh. sort of uh, cross-cultural um, narrative right there. That's actually really fascinating. So those were um, the questions I had um, concerning mm -hmm. your books. And I would like to turn it over to Kino Kania's Ariel Valdez, who highly recommended your work. And he has more in-depth questions that we'd like to explore. So just one moment as we switch. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I am. Um, hello, Mike. Hi, uh, Ariel. Nice to meet you. Yeah, same here. Um, I'm the, um, uh, I guess you could say the, the resident fanboy here for your book. <laughs> um, you know, um, I, I just want to say, uh, first of all, um, uh, the, this book is great. I mean, um, there's really nothing like it right now. Um, like the, the, the kind of um, uh, uh, breadth of um, research you bring to bear on the subject. Um, and, and, and not only that, uh, you, you just... Um, the way you write, like you, you, you write like you're um, like a novelist. It's, it's great, you know? Um, so it's, it's both uh, sort of academically rigorous, but also just well-written. Um, really appreciate okay, that. Well, thank you. Really glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, well, um, I, I have a couple of questions. Uh, so um, first one, um, so, you know, the, the historic dec uh, decriminalization of drugs um, uh, that we're seeing, for example, in places like Oregon, um, mm -hmm. Washington State, um, you know, all, all of these um, states, uh, and, and they, they've happened recently. Um, how do you feel about that? Um, this? Uh, it, it feels to me like a very positive development, mm -hmm. um, but it also feels like a way station, a stage on the way to something else. I think yeah. the trouble with um, decriminalization is it uh, solves some problems, but mm -hmm. um, 
it's potentially kind of the worst of both worlds because what you're doing is you're allowing the sort of, uh, um, you know, the, the markets to flourish, but you're not legalizing the market. So it's kind of a, a, a carte blanche for the sort of criminal suppliers. So my sense is that this is great, but ultimately you need to move towards uh, legal regulation of supply as well as of consumption. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's definitely, um, that's right. Um, well, a, a, a related uh, question. Um, what do you think, if it was up to you, um, how would you organize how um, psychedelics are controlled um, in the United States and throughout mm -hmm. the world? Um, how, how would you do it um, to, mitigate, to mitigate some of the negative effects of you know um, the uh, black markets and things like that, and and maybe sort of like a um, irresponsible use um, on mm -hmm. the streets. Uh, yeah, I, I mean I think um, a lot of the tools that uh, we need to do that are right there already. Uh, not just in the way that we regulate, say alcohol or mm -hmm. tobacco or. Um, uh, pharmaceutical or prescription drugs, but also generally the way that we regulate, you know, risky or dangerous activities, dangerous sports and so on. Um, you know, I don't think this is complicated. Uh, I'm, I'm not a I'm, 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 I'm not a bureaucrat, um, but there are lots of very able bureaucrats out there. And this is really about the evidence, following the evidence for, you know, the system that produces um, you know, that, that minimizes harms. And, um, you know, there are lots of different categories and lots of different uh, ways of doing this available. My preference, I think, would be um, for something that was kind of bottom up and local rather than kind of top down and, uh, and, and federal. Uh, there are some interesting examples in Europe of things like um, in Spain, the cannabis clubs, as they're called, the marijuana clubs, you know, mm -hmm. which are kind of membership clubs um uh where once you uh once you join you can kind of um put in two or three plants to be grown and get them back you know and these sounds clubs like are, a, it these sounds clubs, like a great idea yeah yeah and these clubs are licensed you know so they have to stick to the terms of their license if uh uh you know if the substances that they're given are found being sold on the streets they lose their license mm -hmm. um you know if a lot of people um seem to have uh misadventures and a lot of harm is caused by their members they lose their license but how they manage that is up to them you know so um that would um that's a model that appeals to me for psychedelics because i think um it's one where a lot of the lessons that need to be learned can be taught by um uh, other psychedelic users you know and that's really the best place for them to come from so uh, clubs can be different, you know, depending on their clientele, depending on the areas that um, they're covering. You know, if people feel that uh, you need to be pretty cautious and mandate that somebody has to have a straight trip sitter the first time they use or whatever, you know, that's, that's up to them. So it seems to me that uh, trying to get government to legislate on all these tiny details is never going to work, but a lot of it can be solved, you know, from the grassroots by common sense. I, I I agree. I, I like that bottom up idea. It's um, it's a it, usually um, you know, if when you when you're trying to do something uh, top down, um, there's always something that gets left out. You know, um, well, so uh, recently um, psychedelics have become more respected in academia, um, and I think mm -hmm. that's a great thing. But there's been an uh, I think an overemphasis on the uh, on a kind of medicinal framework. Um, what do you think about that? Well, I'm with you, Ariel. I think um, it's, uh, I mean, there, you know, th there are two kind of schools of thought about this. I mean, a lot of the people who've been, you know, trying to make psychedelics acceptable for a long time have pushed the medicalization model because they say, you know, it's like with marijuana, mm -hmm. you know, you go there first and then you uh, answer a lot of the questions and deal with a lot of the problems and then you can extend further to uh, general legal regulation. But certainly at the moment, um, a lot of the rhetoric that's coming from people who are pushing for um, medical, clinical, therapeutic use is to try and distinguish what they're doing very clearly from what they call recreational use you know, which is uh, illicit and, you know, in their view, dangerous and so on. Um, that's, you know, I think um, 
I think clinical medicine is going to have a very hard time um, adjusting to psychedelics. They're not like other pharmaceutical medicines. Uh, the way that they're used is not the same. This is really a kind of talk therapy in which, to which they're an adjunct. Um, and I think um, at this point, um, I suspect that um, clinical practitioners have a lot more to learn from what they call recreational users than the other way around. Right, yeah, I, I agree. Um, and in, in some sort of, um, I guess this is a kind of, uh, we've come full circle because um, in, in, if you look at the way psychedelics are, um, have been approached um, in the past, right, um, by um, the native peoples of, of North and Mesoamerica, um, it, it's, it, it seems like a kind of a ancient form of talking cure. You know, there's a kind of setting um, mm -hmm. There's a priest who officiates over, you know, or roadman, you know, who officiates over the um, the, mm -hmm. the the proceedings. Um, it's not a kind of um, one to one um, correlation between this chemical compound and this effect, you know. Yeah. Um, so I I think we're going to be forced to go there, you know. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly it, and I think that's happening already. If you look at the way that, for example, uh, Marines and military veterans with PTSD are using substances like ayahuasca um you know that's very much a group thing it looks more like something like alcoholics anonymous or narcotics anonymous than it does like a, a, a clinic and it seems that what's really important there is to be going through this experience with people who share your condition who share your trauma and who also have been through this therapy as well you know there's a great film of this with uh, marines saying to each other look i know it sounds crazy taking this weird psychedelic drug but trust me you know i was where you are now and it really worked for me and it seems to me that's what you need and that's what you get you know as you referenced in something like the native american church everybody sits down and does it together it's a group experience everybody helps everybody it's not just about you know the individual it's about, um, you know, the whole group healing itself. And then immediately with, um, you know, clinical medicine, we're starting, you know, with this medical professional figure in the center. So you're lying there in a clinic and you've got your eye mask on and you're listening to music on the headphones. And uh, there's this strange kind of power dynamic and uh, imbalance. And this is somebody you're going to see for one day and probably never see in the rest of your life. You know, all these things are, um, uh, you know, I think if you start... I mean, obviously, people are starting from the necessity to, you know, get these substances approved by the FDA or whatever. So it's all working through those clinical pharmaceutical structures. But I think if you started from the experience and from the healing that you're trying to generate, you would come up with something much more like, you know, these kind of group PTSD sessions or um, Alcoholics Anonymous or something much more like that kind of um, uh, sort of uh, group healing with, uh, you know, long term support. That's that's great. Uh, a, a related question, I think. Um, uh, what do you think about uh, for-profit companies? Um, uh, just just one like like Compass, for example, um, that are trying to like get a hold on this this new um, commercial um, psychedelic market. Uh, what, what do you think about that? Well, it's a gold rush right now. Right. Everybody is piling in. Um, big pharma and Silicon Valley and venture capital, you know, are putting in billions of dollars. You know, there's all this kind of trading going on in uh, intellectual property, you know, all kinds of, uh, you know, um, patents being filed. Uh, and, you know, this is kind of, uh, you know, and, and a lot of people who are now in this space are not the people, you know, who were kind of, you know, uh, doing the hard work for decades, you know, yeah. carrying the torch when this was not fashionable. So this is a space in which lots and lots of people and lots and lots of dollars are piling in. And we'll see what comes out the other side. But um, my sense, as I said uh, before, is that, um, you know, this is kind of a hard thing to medicalize mm -hmm. and to monetize. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think, and I suspect that a lot of people who are um, investing now, uh, you know, uh, you know, if we look again in two or three years, I think the shape of this whole thing will have will, will have changed considerably. So um, I'm kind of watching um, with interest, but a little skepticism. Right, right. Um, I, um, I I saw um, what happened to uh, to cannabis, um, and I, I hope we don't we like the, the, the psychedelics don't go there. And and I agree. I don't think you can. It's not so easy to um, commercialize and medicalize in the kind of um, standard way psychedelics. 
um, uh, we've seen some attempts, right? Like with like um, a, a kind of overemphasis on uh, micro dosing. Um, mm -hmm. it, it sort of kind of fits the, um, the, the sort of pharmaceutical model of um, uh, here you take a dose and you come back and you just keep on coming back for a dose as opposed to um, taking one big and significant dose and not needing to come back for a year or ever. Yeah, yeah we've just seen the first microdosing um, double blind trial here at the, in uh, Imperial College London. And uh, it seemed to show that, yeah, microdosing um, has positive effects, but also the placebo has positive effects and it was impossible to tell them apart, you know? So, um, I mean, I think a lot of this comes down to this question of whether we go down an exclusively medical route or not, um, because what's the value of having, you know, an exclusively licensed and patented uh, preparation of psilocybin um, if, you know, it's legal to grow your own magic mushrooms? Right. You know, so I think, um, you know, my view is that we should let a thousand flowers bloom, that um, uh, there should be, um, uh, you know, psychedelics can be used in all kinds of ways. And um, if that works in the context of medical clinical therapy, that's fine. But I don't think the rules for everybody should be determined by whether it fits into this clinical framework or not. I totally agree. Um, uh, so this one's a... Um, you covered some of this um, briefly in, in the book, um, but I was wondering if you can expand a little bit. So you, you, you wrote a, a long form um, essay in the London Review of Books on MK Ultra, which I thought mm. was fascinating. It was just great. A again, it, it's just, it just seems to be your trademark, you know, well-researched and beautiful, gorgeous writing. Um, <laughs> um, can, can you speak a little bit on, on the role of psychedelics and, may, and maybe sort of emphasizing on mescaline in MKUltra? Yeah, psychedelics were a big part of the um, CIA's secret mind control program, MKUltra. Mostly LSD, in fact, was the one that they really uh, went with. Um, the idea, and this was kind of the height of the Cold War, the idea was to use psychedelic drugs, among other techniques like... Um, you know, the electro shock and, uh, you know, psychic driving to break down um, minds and personalities so that you could then rebuild them and in the way and program them in the way that you wanted. And um, part one of that project kind of worked fine, but I don't think anybody seriously doubted that you could destroy people's minds by giving them huge overdoses of drugs and electro shock and everything else. Um, part two of that, the idea that you could then have a blank slate that you could rebuild a personality on, that never ever got off the ground, you know, so I think with hindsight, this is kind of my point in that piece is, you know, at the time, um, if you, uh, you know, the Cold War assumption was that this was a crucial battle for the mind and um, that the communists had this and if America didn't have it, they'd lose, you know, but, you know, stepping away from that and looking at it from where we are now, um, it was really just state-sanctioned torture. Right. Um, so uh, th this one's a, a sort of off-the-cuff um, question. Um, you, you, we can edit it out if you like, um, but uh, I, I was sort of just um, uh, lurking around Twitter and I, and I saw your recent post on a, a fascinating uh, uh, study on um, on people seeing Lilliputians, uh, small, little people. Mm -hmm. It's a fascinating story. The, the fact that you can um, research such a strange topic in such a dry and quantitative way, um, it's fascinating. But um, do, do you do you think? Um, for, well, first of all, um, do, do you think in the in the paper they mentioned something? Uh, they compared. Um, the experiences, the entity experiences of people who see litty, little people and mm. uh, the DMT um, entity um, mm -hmm. experience, right? Um, do you think there's, um, do you think there's anything like that in masculine? Um, it, it, or, um, or do you think that uh, maybe masculine doesn't have that kind of phenomenology of, of you know, entity encounters? Um, yeah, I mean, I, th I thought that was a fascinating paper because, you know, within um, psychedelic culture, everybody's familiar with Terence McKenna and his take on DMT, that you meet these 
entities that he called machine elves. And he always said, you know, this was just, uh, this is how you could tell that you were actually really going in hyperspace to another dimension, because otherwise, how could you possibly see these kind of strange beings? And I've been aware for a long time that, for example, people who take medication for Parkinson's disease, you know, often see um, little people. And I've kind of followed this a little bit, and because there is a whole history of hallucinations outside that. Um, so I was kind of, um, I, so that, that, that's why I found that paper interesting because it showed that um, this is actually something that happens in quite a lot of different contexts, uh, you know, uh, drugs and, um, uh, you know, cognitive disorders and, uh, you know, there are various contexts in which we can see these little people who might be, you know, extremely engaging and appealing or not. Um, my sense is that this is quite distinctive within psychedelic dr drugs to the tryptamines and particularly DMT. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think um, uh, mescaline, as I mentioned earlier, being a different class of drug is rather more embodied right. and uh, you tend to have a sort of more oceanic feeling of being at the centre of things rather than being assailed by some other consciousness from outside. Mm -hmm. I think the great example of a um, entity encounter on mescaline is in Carlos Castaneda's books uh, where he writes about um, meeting a sort of uh, green warty skinned um, character who is um, the uh, uh, you know the embodiment of peyote but uh, to me that stands so far outside you know any other experiences that I've read about with peyote and mescaline or indeed my own experiences. I think that as with a lot else, um, Castaneda was uh, spinning a very good and interesting um, fiction and passing it off as fact. Right. So I would say that um, that kind of encounter is much less common on mescaline than it is on other psychedelics. Mm, right, right. Um, well, um, th thank you um, for, um, for taking the time to uh, answer our questions. Um, and, and especially uh, that last question. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was I was wondering about that for for a couple of days. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to turn it over to um, Raphael, my coworker, and um, thank you, Mike uh, Francis. Oh, real pleasure to meet you, Ariel. Same here. Uh, thank you so much um, for that amazing discussion. <laughs> uh, we all love to hear it here. Oh, it's a pleasure. <laughs> So, um, as I mentioned, uh, would you be willing to read for us a passage? Um, yeah, I will. Mescaline. I'll read you a short passage. I thought I'd pick um, a passage from a, a world, a, a, a sort of part of psychedelic history that's not very familiar, which is the 1930s. Um, and that time, quite a lot of um, psychiatrists and psychologists used mescaline to study hallucinations. And... Uh, uh, in several instances, they recruited artists to take mescaline and to draw what they were seeing so that they could uh, understand it better. And this is a um, short account of uh, experiments in the 1930s at the Maudsley Psychiatric Hospital in London uh, with a British surrealist artist <laughs> called Julian Trevelyan. Trevelyan recalled being driven to the hospital in the morning and injected with mescaline crystals in solution at around 10 o'clock. After an hour of slight nausea, suddenly the fireworks started with their magical transfiguration of everything I looked at. His hand shook as he attempted to draw what he was seeing, yet while it lasted I could not put a line wrong. The line was no longer on the surface of the paper but quivering in space like a wire perspectives and recessions dripped off my pencil. When he shut his eyes, a world of cosmic imagery, a sort of mechanical ballet became visible. After a couple of hours, he was taken to lunch in the hospital canteen where I remember sitting at a table amongst white coated doctors with a plate of spaghetti and cauliflower in front of me whose intricate forms fascinated me beyond belief. Trevelyan felt that its primary effect was the hyper-awareness of the beauty of things. Under mescaline, he wrote, I have fallen in love with a sausage roll. I've also looked at pictures by Picasso, Van Gogh, Michelangelo and others and have rejected them all as ready-mades. His productions under the influence, he felt, have remained valid, though I know that they're not great works of art, but 
only the traveler's sketches from that surprising re region of the mind from which, without mescaline, I'm forever debarred. That is beautiful and <laughs> humorous at the same time. <laughs> wow. The ready-made the, the ready bit on the, the famous paintings is really just fascinating. Yeah, that's a surrealist. <laughs> 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 so, of course, uh, one last request. Um, I know we've been taking a lot of your time, but would you be willing to give a pitch for readers uh, for your book, Masculine, and why they should read it? Okay, well, I hope it's full of great stories and um, really works as an entertaining read from beginning to end. But I also hope that um, it's kind of mind expanding in the way that psychedelics are, that it expands our horizons and uh, makes us think about the subject in whole new ways. And I'm sure, as Ariel was mentioning, it definitely did that um, for us. So thank you very much, Mike, for this fascinating discussion and uh, spending time with us um, today. Like you said, our mind has definitely been broadened by this discussion. Um, and I'm sure many who hear this will agree and definitely want to pick up the book and explore this topic further. Um, Masculine, A Global History of the First Psychedelic is published by uh, Yale University, available in paperback. We have books for sale and we will leave a link to that in the description box below um, so you guys can purchase. Once again, Mike, thank you very much for your time. It has been a pleasure um, uh, speaking with you and meeting with you today. Yeah, great pleasure for me, Rafael. Thank you. <laughs>